Father, we thank you that we could come out this evening. We pray for our brother Chad that he's making a safe journey back home. I know that he is at the mercy of the railroad when he comes and when he goes. And we ask that you'd be with the prayer requests we just made and Lord, to work in their lives, be with Teresa and the uh, Dooley family there that's lost a loved one and for the fires that are burning out of Maui. For James, we thank you how well James is doing now as a recovery and pray that recovery be complete. And for Norma, the ankle, that she would have something done about that quickly. And all those on our prayer list, Lord, we lift up to you now. We're now, Father, going to open your word, and that's why we're here. We're here to hear from your word and hear what you have to tell us this evening. And we're opening it to the little short letter of Jude. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten the word for us and lead us in this time of, well, sermon and study as we learn so much now, Lord, from this little, little book. I know that some people think that because it's small, it's not important, but, oh, it certainly is. Everything in your word is important for us. So I pray as always that you would guide us and direct us in this time and that everything that we say, do, and even what we think tonight would be for your honor and for your glory. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the title of the sermon today. Perfectly Preserved. Now, you can look at that a lot of ways when people think about that, but I think as we go through tonight and through the message here, you'll realize why I named it such. Jude 1. You don't have to worry about a chapter because it's just one. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. I had originally thought about several verses here, but as I began to break it down, I realized I couldn't do it. I mean, I could do it, but we'd be here till somebody fell asleep or maybe fell out the window like we read in Scripture. So just one verse tonight, and it, uh, I promise not to be too long with it. And it's very interesting the way that Jude begins this little short letter. It seems his, his first idea to the original readers of this text was on some theme of salvation. There's something he wants to tell them. But you remember, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had a different purpose that he wanted Jude to write about. And so he uh, had Jude, he introduced Jude to, to these writers, the writer of this book, to his original readers, and may I say, ours too, to the days of apostasy, which would be coming upon the church. As we move forward, you're going to find out that apostasy was already in the church. Apostasy means a falling away. In this case, a falling away from the doctrine, a falling away from the truth, falling away from the teaching of Scripture. What Jude is doing here, talking about this period of time, is giving the believer assurance of his salvation regardless of the situation that's going on in the world. He said, it doesn't matter what Jude's going to be, what Jude says, it doesn't matter what's going on out there. It doesn't matter about the false teaching. It does, and I'm not saying it doesn't matter. He's saying it will not affect your salvation. No matter what's going on, it will not affect you. So I want to read verse 1 once again before we break it down. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Jude is the English form of a name that you're very familiar with, Judas. And there are three different men in the New Testament with the name Judas. And I think that it's wonderful that this book comes to us titled Jude rather than Judas because of the connotation of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus. So it's little things like that are really remarkable, aren't they? But just who was Jude who wrote this 
short but very important letter. Who is this Jude? Well, evidently, well, with the strong evidence that we have, the author of this epistle is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, all Jesus' brothers and sisters were halves. Mary was their mother, but Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He's the Son of God. All the siblings are half, and Jude is no exception. Being the Son of God, conceived of the Holy Spirit, all the siblings were normal, normally born through Joseph and Mary. And Jude also tells us that he is a servant of Christ Jesus. Now we talked about this this morning. Jesus didn't tell, told the believer, you're my servant. Jude goes right along with it. He's a servant, literally a bond servant. Exactly the same word we saw this morning. As a bond slave who was freed from his, by his master, but he willingly returns to serve the master for the rest of his life. You know, Paul uses this term quite often, a bond servant. And this, of course, should be the attitude of every born-again believer. We all should, as we mentioned, should be that bond servant to the Lord. We willingly put ourselves under Him as His servant. You know, we were before salvation slaves to sin. But that's a different connotation, isn't it? When we came to Jesus, we were freed from slavery. And I'm talking about that was slavery. That wasn't willful servitude. It was slavery. We were in bonds there. And it was because of our love for Jesus, we had freely and willingly become the Lord's servant. We do it, and it's different. It's do it because we love Him, not because we're in chains. Before we came to Jesus Christ, if you could open your spiritual eyes, it would be kind of like Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. You would see the chains that you're carrying with you because you were in bondage. But every believer should be willing to make the choice of being a servant for Jesus Christ. It is a choice that you need to make. Please consider the fact that being a servant of the Lord Jesus is not like being a slave to man. But rather, when you're a servant of Jesus Christ, it is a different lifestyle for you. And that lifestyle will bring you joy and happiness as you serve Him by living your life in a God-honoring, God-pleasing manner and witnessing to the lost about the glorious gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. There's something else I hope you picked up on as we read that little one verse, our passage this evening. And that's the fact that, did you notice that Jude made no claim whatsoever about being a blood relative of Jesus Christ. You know, most people take pride in who they're related to. If they have a famous or an important relative, they'll tell you about it pretty often, won't they? Notice Jude does not mention that. When you have the problem of pride and it jumps up and takes hold of you, then you want to talk about those things. <clears throat> But Jude doesn't do that. I believe Jude did this in order to not give the wrong impression. As I said before, you, it's hard to win a person to the Lord with a prideful attitude. And Jude did not want to appear that he was taking a some superior position by saying, well, yes, I'm the, I'm the Lord's brother. He didn't do that. You know, there was a time in church history it was during the post-apostolic age type period. All the apostles had died off. They began to look at the family of Jesus in extremely high regard because they somehow looked upon that family as being some type of super-duper spiritual people. But you know, every member of Jesus' family, whether they were half-brothers, half-sisters, Mary, Joseph, they needed to come to salvation. I don't care if it's cousins, uncles, they have to come. It's like being a member of Israel. It's a wonderful thing, but unless you come to the Lord, you can't find salvation. Your family relationship will not save you. I think this is the idea that might best be explained over in Luke chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as he, speaking of Jesus, 
spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps that thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they which hear the word of God and keep it. You see what Jesus said? It's not family. That's physical. That's the important thing we need to remember. That's fam physical. Jesus said it's wonderful what, what your family may have done. But the important thing is your spiritual life. And here it is. To hear the Word of God and to keep it. You know, James says over in James 1.22, but be ye doers of the word, not and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Again, you take the word of God. That's that's our roadmap. That's our directions. You hear it, you use it, you put it in your life. The important thing for us to see here is the word of God. Within the pages of the Bible is everything you need to know. There are a lot of things I would like to know that I don't, but God has given us everything we need to know. The Word of God shows man's shortcomings, shows man's sins, shows his iniquities, as well as his total rebellion against God. You know, that demonstrates the fact that it's a God-breathed book. If man had written this book, he would never have mentioned shortcomings or sins or anything like that. We would have looked so wonderful. We would be perfect if this were a man-written book. You know, the Bible contains the promises of God. And all the coming events that we know about, need to know about in our eternity, in our future. Keep the Word of God close to your heart and use it at every opportunity as you tell others about the saving power of Jesus Christ and God's infinite mercy and His grace. It's obvious too as you read Jude if you want to read through it during the week, it won't take you but a few minutes. It's very short. But it's obvious that Jude had done a great deal of growing spiritually over the years. And that's the same thing that we need to... It's the same path. We need to follow the same path if we're going to grow. And we need to be continually growing spiritually. I don't care if you've been saved one week, one month, one year, or 10 years, or 50 years. You need to be spiritually growing every day because we're never going to reach the end of spiritual maturity in this life. And then Jude tells us that he is the brother of James. That's the simple and humble way that Jude introduces himself. Servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James. Both James and Jude were full brothers. They had the same mother, same father, but they're half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James is the author of the epistle that I read from just a moment ago. There's his name. And we can see the effect that the resurrection had on these two brothers because we see that James was also the same man the Apostle Paul mentioned as one of the pillars in the church in Jerusalem. You remember that during Jesus' earthly ministry, the family were following him very closely. It took the resurrection to bring that family to a saving knowledge of the Lord. And they've been with him all, all their lives. Then June tells us to whom the letter was written. To them that are sanctified by God the Father. Well, guess what? This letter is addressed to you and me. Because we are all sanctified by God the Father. We came to Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Remember that. That means everyone here this evening is a believer. There is some discussion though about the word that's translated sanctified. The best Greek text used the verb agapeo, which means to love, rather than hagiazo, which means to sanctify. Most scholars agree that to love is more accurate than to sanctify. It, may, it really makes a a very little difference in whichever way you want it. your heart wants to translate it. But it really helps your heart to know that you are loved and beloved by God the Father. One Greek master 
translated this verse as the reader of the time would have understood it. It's very much like the way I, I taught Revelation. He says this. This is the way they would have understood it. Jude, a bond slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who by God the Father have been loved are in the same state of being the permanent objects of his love and whom for Jesus Christ have been guarded and are in a permanent state of being carefully watched to those who are called ones. I like that. I really do. That really amplifies what's being said. You know, and it does, it's wonderful, but yet, whichever way you prefer, sanctified or to love, the verse is wonderful. Sanctified means you've been set aside for the purpose of, of Christ. You have a job to do. And you were loved, we know that, while you were at sinners, Christ died for you. So both words, you know, placely, firmly place something before you. you know? Both words have one powerful meaning for you. Eternal security. Both of them. Whether you use sanctify or whether you use love, it's eternal. Eternal security. That's a wonderful thing to know. Keep in mind that every Christian is a saint. You don't, like I say, you don't need to be dead 200 years to have two or three miracles to your credit to be a saint. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a saint. Isn't that wonderful? I'm saint so-and-so. We don't do that, but that's what it is. You've been set aside for a purpose. And every Christian is beloved by God the Father and preserved eternally for Jesus Christ. Eternal security. If that's not a reason to rejoice, I don't know what is. To know that you're eternally loved, eternally saved. Wow. I want to discuss several words, though, this evening in this passage and later on in Jude because they're so important. The first word I want to discuss this evening is the word preserved. Preserved. The word preserved is the key to the entire book of Jude because it presents the apostasy as it's given nowhere else in the entire Bible. This little book contains more information about the apostasy then and the apostasy coming than any other book. And we find that as we look at the apostasy that falling away that's presented here in this little letter, it's frightening to think about what's going on. And this was 2,000 years ago. But Jude's purpose in writing this letter was not to frighten the daylights out of Christians, but rather to encourage them and comfort the born-again believer. That's what he's doing. And sometimes people read things and they become frightened by the events. But focus on the message. It's like you come to Jesus because the miracles, I want to talk about the miracles and Jesus focus on me. And Jude doesn't write simply to give us a powerful picture for our information. He doesn't do that. The reason he gave us all this background is in order that he might give the believer assurance in the days of apostasy. Now, he doesn't give us assurance in the tribulation. He doesn't. Why? Because we're not going to be there. The apostasy, there will become a time when apostasy is so great we're out of here. But he's talking about the apostasy during our lifetime. When the time, when that falling away occurs, and we won't, I don't want to get into that tonight, but the apostasy then, the falling away is the rapture. That's why we're given no instructions. You know this in Scripture? Even in Revelation, there are no instructions given to the church on how to survive during the tribulation because we're not there. If we were going to be there, there would be step by step of what we needed to do, just like everywhere else in Scripture. So he gives us this background to give us assurance. Now, no matter what happens in this world, the believers are safe and secure in the mighty hands of God. Now, let me tell you something, Christians. We are seeing those days of apostasy beginning in earnest in our world today. It's been going on since the church began, but it's, we see it picking up steam now. 
There's a falling away from the truths of God's Word, a falling away from the truth of God Himself, and a falling away from the salvation which comes only through Jesus' sacrifice. There's a turning away from the truth. And we've been told that there would be teachers teaching false things, itching ears, and that sort of thing. Preserved. We are preserved in the worst times. There's another word that Jude uses over in this book. He uses it four times. And it's the word keep. By the way, the word preserve means what? To keep. They're connected together. That means you're kept in Jesus Christ and I am kept in Jesus Christ. In verse 21, Jude says, keep yourselves in love of God. In verse 24, he says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And we'll talk about these more as we get there, but I wanted to point this out. Preserve. He's, gonna, he's able to preserve you from falling. He preserves you in your love for him. Call it what you will as you read these verses. But you know what? It gives assurance to the, the believer in the darkest days of apostasy. And I have a name for it. I'm going to tell you again that name for it is eternal security. That's how you make it through the dark days, whether it's apostasy or illness or whatever it befalls you, knowing that you're eternally saved. As I mentioned a moment ago, you and I are presently living in an age of apostasy. How much farther we're going to go through the apostasy before the rapture, I can't tell you. And honestly, no one else can tell you either. No one knows. Nobody on the face of this earth knows when the Lord's going to come and snatch us out of here. I know there are people who try to tell you, but they don't know either. But I do know that there's a time that's coming when God's wrath is going to overflow because of this world's sin. And Jesus is going to come. He's going to snatch His church out of here. We're going to meet Him in the air. And the tribulation will begin. God's wrath upon this earth. You know, Jesus described the tribulation over in Matthew 24, 21 like this. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You know, people have said, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever researched it or not world war one was a tribulation nothing was ever like it before and then came world war ii and then you have the bombs now that can do more damage than all the soldiers did there's nothing compared to what's going to happen jesus nothing like it before nothing like it ever will happen again and just think of the judgments that have been poured out on this world the flood Sodom, you know, etc. And Jesus says there's never been anything like it in the past or ever will again. Oh, how awful those seven years are going to be. And praise the Lord, we won't have to be there for one second of it. Not one second. And it always reminds me that we've been told that we're not, the church is not to undergo wrath. The word is orge. That's the same word that they use for tribulation. We have God's Word that we are not to have to undergo that wrath, have to endure it at all. Again, that's the promise of a pre-trib rapture. And also beware. Be very much aware of the time setters. And there have been many over the years. There was one fellow, I can't remember his name, but every year he came out with a date for this to happen or that to happen and it never did. And every single one of them has always been wrong. And the Bible says if a prophet makes a prediction, he calls for a prophecy and it doesn't come true, that person's a false prophet. And let me tell you, there have been a bunch of them out there and there's still a bunch of them today have been throughout history. But without a doubt, we are in the times of apostasy. And things are going to get worse. You heard me. Things are going to get worse. Much, much worse. I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just stating a fact. It's going to get worse. But for us, it will then get better. Now, looking at the word preserved, it's interesting that the physical world, there are two basic ways of preserving food, isn't it? 
One is vinegar and the other sugar. There are many Christians today that are indeed preserved. They're believers. But it seemed like they're preserved in vinegar. I call them the... They have that vinegar disposition. I don't even like the smell of vinegar. I don't know how you mask, but it's just not pleasant. But there's also saints, Christians, born-again believers who are preserved with sugar. You know, their sugar and spice and everything nice. And they're not all women either. But they're preserved with sugar. But even the saints that are preserved in vinegar are preserved by God's grace, which preserves and keeps them. In other words, whether you're a really hard-working Christian, whether you're a backsliding Christian, you're preserved. Whether you're a Christian who's witnessing at every opportunity or one who never witnesses at all, if you're a born-again believer, you're preserved. Don't expect the same amount of rewards, but you are preserved. So the Apostle John tells us in Revelation 12, 11, that they that overcome him, talking about Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. And that's the only way to come to salvation during the tribulation. Those during, are going to make it. Yep. People are going to be saved during the tribulation. I've heard people preach that, well, you go into tribulation, no chance to be saved. Well, they better read Revelation. There are untold numbers who are martyred. We see them, John sees them before the throne and then asks, how long, O oh Lord, before you avenge our blood? They are tribulation believers. Tribulation saints, not church saints. Tribulation saints. And at the end of the tribulation, you have the sheep and goats. Those sheep that go into the kingdom, they were saved during the tribulation because there's not one saved person that goes into the tribulation. Everyone that goes in is lost. Yeah. There's not one believer that goes into the tribulation, but there are going to be many, many who are going to be saved during the tribulation. Well, there's, on the other hand, when we get to the end of the tribulation, Jesus establishes his kingdom. There's not going to be one unsaved person that goes into the kingdom. Not one. By the way, as you know, or at least I pray that you know, this is also the only way that we are going to overcome. That's by the blood of the Lamb. That's how we're saved, by the blood of the Lamb. We, and I mean every single one of us, have no merit, we have no power to overcome the evil one. Now let me go back to an illustration which the Lord Jesus Christ Himself gave when He said, I'm the Good Shepherd, and the Good Shepherd giveth His life for the sheep. Then the Lord began to talk about His sheep in John 10, beginning at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. You see, if a sheep is kept in safety, it's no credit to the sheep. The sheep did not keep himself safe. He has to depend on the shepherd. Matter of fact, a sheep cannot defend himself in any way, shape, or form. A sheep is unarmed, so to speak. He doesn't have fangs, doesn't have claws. He can't fight off the enemy. A sheep can't not even outrun a wolf. He can't run his enemy. Well, you say, well, how about a rabbit? A rabbit can't defend himself, but a rabbit can run and get away. He has speed. A sheep doesn't. Sheep can't even run away in a quick hurry like that rabbit. And remember, we told in Psalm 103, 100 verse 3, but we are all His people and the sheep of His pasture. We are sheep. We are defenseless. We are unable to run away. We need a good shepherd. So in one of God's sheep, that's a believer in Jesus Christ, says he knows he is saved. He is not bragging on his own merit. He's not bragging on his own ability. He is boasting in his Savior. I'm saved because of Jesus Christ. We have a wonderful shepherd, a good shepherd, 
a great shepherd, the chief shepherd. When a person says, though, that he's not sure of his salvation, they are reflecting badly upon the shepherd because Jesus, our good shepherd, says he can keep you. There are people who think they can lose their salvation. That reflects bad on the Lord who said, I have you eternally in my hand and my Father has you in His hand. And you say, I can lose my salvation? That reflects poorly on your shepherd. If you're one of those who think you can lose your salvation, you better listen to Jesus, the good shepherd, and your life will be better. Once you realize you can't lose it, you're going to really enjoy life. It doesn't mean you go out and sin, but it means that you know without a fact that you can't lose it. The Lord Jesus also says that no created thing is able or will ever be able to take you out of the Father's hands. Boy, that's the joy of eternal security. Turned into eternal security message tonight, I know. But it's there. It's important. You see, it's not of a question of whether or not you can hold on to God. A lot of people, that's what they think. Can I hold on to God? The question is, is He holding on to you? And if you're a born-again believer, He's got you. Jesus tells us that He can hold on to you. It's a matter of trusting Him. Here's a fact you can take to the bank. Salvation rests upon the Word of God. Once again, you have a choice to make. Either you believe what God tells you in His Word, or you will not. That's it. That's simple. You know why the world is in the shape it's in? They don't believe the Word of God. But whether you believe or not the Word of God, what the Bible says, it doesn't change the truth one bit. Truth is truth. It can't be changed. You can say whatever you want. You can scream it. You can yell it. It doesn't change the Word of God. Your assurance of salvation rests upon the Word of God because the Lord has made it very clear that you have a sure salvation. And my Bible says God cannot lie. And your Bible says the same thing. As we get deeper into this little letter of Jude, we're presented with the dark days of apostasy and God still says that even in the worst of times, He is able to hold His own. No matter what happens, He's got you. Don't be discouraged. And called. Okay. Now that we should, we should be assured of the fact that we're preserved in Jesus Christ and we're safe in Him, we also need to realize that we're also called, or we were called. The word called, as it's used in Scripture, it not, it's not only an invitation that is sent out, but it's an invitation that is sent out and accepted and made real because of the Spirit of God. It's an invitation that is accepted. Come and be saved. The Holy Spirit calls your heart. It's an invitation. You are called when you accept that invitation. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Notice, to them which are called, whether Jew or Gentile, you accepted the call. It's Jesus Christ. And once you found Christ, you found in Him the wisdom and power of God, you can trust Him. You are one of the called. The called out ones, the called together ones. The Greek word is ekklesia. You know what the English word is? Church. The called together ones, the called out ones. You received the call, you answered it, you're now the church. The invitation was sent out, you accepted, believed, you're the called. Here again, though, you have a choice to make. And I'm going to use the physical to demonstrate the spiritual. Today we live in a, a time when the phone rings nonstop with spam calls, don't we? I don't know how, I've got more phone calls blocked than I have in my phone book. 
When someone calls, you have a choice. You accept that call or not. Most often we don't. Well, what if that call really wasn't a sales call, but someone telling you that you had just inherited a great deal of money and property, but you only have a short period of time to respond or it'll go to someone else? Hmm. The point is, you were called, but you refused to respond. It's the same with salvation. The call goes out, you must respond, and there are only two ways to respond. You accept or reject. If you accept, you're the called. If you reject, you're still the lost. And that's about as plain as this old country boy can explain it to you. And that's exactly what Jude means right here. And Paul spelled it out for us as well. So when the Holy Spirit calls, I pray your heart is ready and you're willing to answer that call and come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for the time tonight. I thank you for this message, this wonderful verse of Scripture. It has reminded us of the eternal security that we have, the assurance that no matter how dark the days, you will preserve us and tell us we're the called. We received the call, we answered, and we're now believers in Jesus Christ, saved for eternity. I pray the Holy Spirit's working in every heart now. As we close this evening, I ask that you be with us, protect us as we go out tonight and in the coming days. Help us to be the witnesses we should be. I pray that you would bring us back again on Wednesday evening where we could once again sit under your word and learn from it. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the words to speak when we have opportunity. And I look forward, Father, to the next Lord's Day where our church family is healthy and not having to work and be here with us. I thank you for our visitors who have come again and pray that they're going to be a permanent part of our church family. And Lord, I just pray your blessing upon our, our people. And I thank you that we are the called and that we have eternal life and that you have us in your hand. I thank you for your word and the salvation that comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.